Weather time. Paul's with us, and our weekend weather comes with a little asterisk next to it. Right. Lightning. A very big asterisk because we're looking at the potential, potential for some dry thunderstorms. And that's never a good thing when the vegetation is so dry. So let's break down what we know at this point or what we think we know and what we don't know yet, what we're still figuring out. First of all, what we know, dry thunderstorms are going to be possible. It's going to be the type of atmospheric setup that is conducive to the development of those storms. The air near the ground and really through the bottom five, 7,000 feet of the atmosphere is just going to be way too dry for any rain produced by those storms to actually reach the ground. The fire fuels, especially above 2,000 feet, are exceptionally dry. The marine layer hasn't had any influence there, and the gusty winds produced by those storms, if they develop, would allow any fires, if they start, to spread very rapidly. What we don't know, and this is obviously the big one, will the storms form in the first place? It's only a 20% chance, but that's a much higher threat than we usually have this time of year. Is it going to be cloud to ground lightning? That's what we don't want to see. Or cloud to cloud or intra cloud lightning? And how many lightning strikes? This isn't going to be a repeat of what we had last August. We had 12,000 lightning strikes. 12 would be too many. The location of those cloud to ground lightning strikes, if they happen, would matter as well. That's impossible to predict. If it's below 2,000 feet in elevation, well, then those fire fuels aren't as ready to go as if the cloud to ground lightning strikes happen higher in elevation. So let's kind of bundle everything up. What you need to know, lightning, it's a low threat overall. Again, it's just a 20% storm chance, the high wind threat in a similar category. The storms have to develop in the first place, but because those threats are there, the fire threat is elevated, but just not going to produce any rain. That fire weather watch goes into effect 5 o'clock on Thursday evening, excuse me, Sunday evening and continues through 11 o'clock Monday morning. I'll put the numbers on the map. Just look at these numbers for the nine states combined. Less than 1% of the western U.S isn't highlighted as being at least abnormally dry. And with another hot and dry summer in progress, it's unlikely that this situation is going to improve over the next few months. But let's come back to the California perspective and compare the current map to our last drought. This is the current map for California as a whole. Doesn't look good. Here's what the map looked like in September of 2014 when the last major drought was at its worst. At that point, almost 60% of California was in exceptional drought much worse than our current status. But similar to right now, over 80% was in at least extreme drought, and 100%, every single square inch of the state, was at least in moderate drought conditions. So how did the last major drought finally end? We can look back over the last two decades with the U.S. Drought Monitor's data and chart the ebb and flow of drought conditions across California. Droughts are cyclical, but no two are exactly alike. For now, like I did with the map of California, I want to zoom in and focus on the last drought and compare it with where we are right now. Our current drought conditions really deteriorated rapidly. See that sudden spike there? But that was also the case back in 2014. And look how long that drought lasted. We really didn't get out of that drought until January of 2017, almost two and a half years after the worst conditions in September of 2014. But notice the little step downs in the data here in those drought conditions the last time around. Normal rainfall for the Bay Area during the rainy season is just under 22 inches. I'm loosely defining the rainy season as October through April, even though we don't get all that much rain in either October or April. That's the downtown San Francisco number. It gives us a nice middle ground between the typically drier South Bay and the typically wetter North Bay. The 2014-2015 rainy season fell about five inches short of average, but that was still close enough to put a dent in the drought conditions overall. Another step toward getting out of the drought came with a near normal rainy season in 2015 and 2016, and we finally broke out of the drought completely with an above average rainy season in 2016 and 2017. Obviously, we would rather get out of the current drought as quickly as possible, and one above average rainy season would pretty much do it. That would be much better than this step-by-step -step improvement we had last decade. So what are the odds of above average rainfall in the 2021-2022 rainy season? Unfortunately, not great. Last winter, downtown San Francisco recorded just under nine inches of rain. That is less than half of average. And one of the big factors driving last winter's weather patterns was a La Nina pattern in the Pacific. A weak La Nina, but it was there. And another La Nina event is expected this winter. Historically, La Nina winters can either be wet or dry in the Bay Area. We're kind of in between, but recently they've trended towards dry, as opposed to El Nino events, which tend to completely rearrange weather patterns on a large scale. La Nina winters are characterized by an amplification of normal patterns. So that means wet areas like the Pacific Northwest get wetter, dry areas like Southern California get even drier. But with the influence of climate change added into the mix, the Bay Area's weather and climate is starting to resemble that of Southern California, 
much more frequently than it does the Pacific Northwest. So amplifying our new normal pattern means that the bulk of the wintertime atmospheric rivers are going to be directed farther to our north again this winter. But don't just take my word for it. The Climate Prediction Center's outlook for December, January, and February, those are our wettest three months, shows an av above average chance of below normal precipitation for the Bay Area with an even stronger signal farther off to our south. It also shows a better than average chance of above average wet, uh, rainfall, a wet winter for the Pacific Northwest. Exactly the pattern that we would expect with another La Nina event driving the large scale weather patterns. Now, none of this is set in the stone. At this point, the odds of a La Nina event actually materializing are about two out of three, or 66%. However, that number has been increasing, and the Climate Prediction Center has already issued a La Nina watch for this winter. It's certainly possible that we'll beat the odds and get some atmospheric rivers to drop down the Pacific coast and pay us a visit here in the Bay Area. It only takes a few of those in a rainy season to make a huge difference. For now, while the long-range data isn't showing us many signs of hope, we're going to keep looking for those signs. At least right now, Paul, it will be a very different scene in the Sierra in just a couple of days. Yeah, well, we're going to get several inches of rain. They're going to get several feet of snow. We'll focus on the Bay Area for now, and we're going to see just mostly cloudy skies tonight. We're in a break from the rain. Tomorrow, some showers possible, but it's going to be light off and on activity. Best chance is going to be the northern half of the Bay Area, and then the storm system is going to arrive on Sunday. The heaviest rain and the strongest winds. Sunday continuing into Sunday night. Let's take a look at the satellite and radar loop right now. Well, we're in that break. Can't rule out the possibility of a couple of sprinkles in the North Bay, but those are going to be few and far between. I think the dry weather is going to last into tomorrow morning. Futurecast does show some showers running into the coast north of us, but for the Bay Area, a few spotty showers through midday, mainly north of the Golden Gate. We'll see those often on showers possible anywhere across the Bay Area, but just a little more concentrated farther north. An area of heavier rain is going to try to work its way in after the sun goes down tomorrow evening. But this is still just heavy shower activity, not the full-fledged heavy rain that arrives Sunday morning. For the northern half of the Bay Area, the heaviest rain is going to be falling right on you through midday on Sunday. And then it gradually starts to work its way farther and farther to the south. By the time we get into Sunday afternoon and Sunday evening, heavy rain falling across the whole Bay Area adding up more and more because it's going to be kind of parked in place for hours on end continue past sunset Sunday evening. It is going to be sloppy out there for the Niners game in Santa Clara, rainy and windy. Now the back edge of the rain is going to be working its way from north to south as we head farther into Sunday night. The heaviest rain moves out of here before the sun comes up on Monday, but still some lingering off and on showers likely as we head through Monday and even lingering into Tuesday. That's just a little bit of icing on top of the main cake of the heavy rain that we're going to get Sunday and Sunday night. Let's add it up. We'll focus on the northern half of the Bay Area first. Look at these numbers. It has been years since we have seen this kind of rain. In fact, it's been 11 years since an atmospheric river of this magnitude has taken aim on the Bay Area. T October of 2010 was the last time it happened during the month of October. We're talking about five to potentially eight inches of rain widespread for the North Bay and even higher amounts possible in the higher elevations, which is, of course, where some of those burn scars are. That's a significant concern. It's also going to be a concern in the Santa Cruz Mountains. More than five inches of rain in the forecast around Ben Lomond, but within the CZU burn scar, the numbers could be even higher. This is forecast model data. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to pick up 6.16 inches of rain in San Ramon, but it gives us an idea of the overall pattern. And this forecast model has a good sense of that pattern because it's very nicely outlining the rain shadow of the Santa Santa Cruz Mountains in the Santa Clara Valley, but even there, San Jose, over an inch and a quarter of rain, two inches of rain around Milpitas, and San Francisco picking up three and a half inches of rain according to the forecast model data. It's also going to be windy. Noticeable wind Saturday night into Sunday morning, but the winds are going to be picking up already by Sunday morning. Some 30 plus mile an hour gusts even before the sun comes up. And look at these numbers as we head towards midday on Sunday. 40 to 50 mile an hour wind gusts. That's enough to push you around on the road. Plus, the roads are going to have some potential flooding issues. And we're going to have to watch for down branches and trees and power outages as well with these 40 to 50 mile an hour gusts on such a widespread basis. So a lot to keep us busy throughout the day on Sunday. That was the DAW at least is dry, and Paul, I guess that's a sign of the beginning of the end, but it's still well underway down south. Yeah, we're still going to pick up more rain and more rain in downtown San Francisco. I mentioned earlier that this is the wettest October day on record. Downtown San Francisco doesn't stop there. This is an exceptional event regardless of the time of year. This is the seventh wettest day on record for downtown San Francisco, and record keeping goes back to 1850. It's 171 years of records. Seventh wettest day 
for any day of the year. And we're actually going to climb a little farther because this is the measurement taken as of 1043 p.m. That extra hour and 17 minutes, it's still raining. We're going to probably climb into the top five for the wettest days on record dating back to 1850 for downtown San Francisco. Let's take a look at the high def Doppler and the rain continues to fall in the South Bay, the Santa Clara Valley, the Santa Cruz Mountains. You're going to see the longest lived rainfall as we head through the rest of tonight. Moderate to heavy rain covering the Santa Clara Valley, the South Bay and the Santa Cruz Mountains. It's coming down even more heavily in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Already seven and a half inches of rain around Ben Lomond. There's moderate to heavy rain for much of the East Bay across the bay itself and then just south of downtown San Francisco. You head down the peninsula and that rain picks up in intensity. And there's another band of heavier rain still making its way through the North Bay, but this is working its way to the southeast and the back edge of the steady rain is going to steadily make more progress southward as we head through the rest of tonight. However, as we switch over to Futurecast, it does look like another area of moisture is going to take shape off the coast and that's going to head in as well. So once we get rid of that heavy rain that was with us all day, there are going to be more showers later tonight with some locally heavy downpours, just adding insult to injury. We need the rain. We just don't want it all at once. That heaviest rain pushes off to the east as the sun comes up, but still more showers for the morning commute. Plan on challenging conditions for the morning commute. Allow as much extra time as you possibly can. And then still some off and on showers possible as we head towards midday, but those are going to be fewer and farther between, especially in the afternoon, down to just a few isolated showers as we head towards midday. Let's add up the additional rainfall. On top of what we have already received, lower amounts around Santa Rosa because you've gotten out of that area of steady rain. But north of the Golden Gate, around a half an inch, maybe a little more than that of additional rainfall, about three quarters of an inch on top of what we've already received in San Francisco, but an inch to an inch and a half for most of the East Bay into the Santa Clara Valley and close to two inches of rain around Ben Lomond. Let's focus more on the CZU burn scar because this is where we're concerned within this red shaded area. That's the burn scar. That's where we're concerned about the potential for debris flows. On the periphery of that burn area, another inch and a half to two inches of rain, but within it, close to three inches of additional rainfall. And there have already been a few reports of some small debris flows within the CZU burn scar. We'll hope we don't see anything larger than that. The winds are starting to die down, a process that will continue as we head through the rest of tonight. The wind will still be noticeable to start the day tomorrow, but it's not going to be nearly as strong as those 40 to 50, even close to 60 mile an hour gusts that we had earlier today. The fog has been quite stubborn lately, and it's been different than the typical marine layer associated fog. This is Thule fog that's been developing, kind of spilling in from the Central Valley. It's called that because of the Thule grass that grows in the Central Valley, and that's where it's really thickest. But you need a specific set of ingredients for this type of fog to develop, and we've seen that for the past several nights and early mornings. Need clear skies overhead, calm winds at ground level, but also ground level moisture. And that's the thing that we've been lacking for the past couple of years with the drought conditions. But the rain that we've added up so far since the beginning of the water year has provided that ground level moisture. So we've seen that thick fog developing, plus an area of high pressure in the upper levels of the atmosphere overhead acts like a lid on top of the atmosphere. Sinking air underneath that helps to trap the fog in place and make it just that much more stubborn. But also anything else that's in the lowest levels of the atmosphere also gets trapped in place. And we're specifically referring to ground level pollutants. That's why the air quality has been an issue for the past few days. A moderate to even unhealthy for sensitive groups, a lot of orange dots on the map. The air quality should gradually improve. I don't think the fog is going to be as stubborn tomorrow, but there's going to be some of it out there. We can see those winds picking up a little bit, helping to improve the air quality. And with clouds overhead tonight, we're not going to see as much of that fog developing. But there's that haze as we look out towards Oakland from the top of Salesforce Tower. Again, just the lid on the atmosphere, keeping that trapped in place. Temperatures are cooling off. We're in the mid to upper 50s right now. There is going to be some fog out there tomorrow morning, but really it's the cloud cover farther up in the atmosphere. Remember, one of the ingredients for that fog to really become dense, clear skies. We don't have that out there. Some of the fog is going to develop. It's going to be more sparse. It's not going to last quite as long. So as it dissipates, we're going to see more sunshine and temperatures are going to warm back up to about what's normal for this time of year. Any fog that is out there tomorrow morning will be long gone by noon.